um, come on, stand up, let's pray, and um, stand up in your home. If you're driving, don't do that, but <laughs> um, Lord, you've been our dwelling place in every generation, and from everlasting to everlasting, you continue to be God. Would you now speak to us that we will live? Would you heal and deliver according to that word? And would you save for your name's sake? Speak, Lord, we're listening. In Jesus' name, amen. Ruth chapter 3 and the first verse. Ruth chapter 3 and the first verse. This is sermon 3 on hidden figures. We are studying, giving a fresh look at the women in the genealogy of Jesus. Chapter 3, verse 1 of Ruth. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, should I not seek rest for you that it may be well with you? Is not Boaz our relative with whose young women you were? See, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Wash, therefore, and anoint yourself and put on your cloak and go down to the threshing floor. But do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. But when he lies down, observe the place where he lies. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down and he will tell you what to do. And she replied, all that you say, I will do. So she went down to the threshing floor and did just as her mother-in-law had commanded her. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. And then she came softly and uncovered his feet and lay down. At midnight, the man was startled and turned over and behold, a woman lay at his feet. He said, who are you? She answered, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your wings over your servant, for you are a redeemer. And he said, may you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. You have made this last kindness greater than the first in that you have not gone after young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you ask. For all my fellow townsmen know that you are a worthy woman. And now it is true that I am a redeemer. Yet there is a redeemer nearer than I. Remain tonight and in the morning. If he will redeem you, good. Let him do it. But if he is not willing to redeem you, then as the Lord lives, I will redeem you. Lie down until the morning. Say amen if you can. I, I want to tag this text and preach about breaking barriers. Breaking barriers. In this sermon series, we are examining flawed women who are loved by a flawless God. It's a good word for all of us, for we are all flawed people. Thanks be to God, we are loved by a flawless God. Today, I want to unpack, as we've already talked about life beyond my worst moment, and we've talked about from shame to fame. Today, I want to deal with the obstacles in our life, the barriers. Uh, an obstacle is that which prevents movement or access. And as I preach today, I want to preach down barriers, Everything that has been limiting my access, anything that has been limiting my movement today, as the word goes forth, I'm asking God to break away all of those barriers and all of those obstacles. Barriers and obstacles that prevent marriages from being great. Barriers and obstacles that prevent vision from being realized. Barriers and obstacles that keep people from being reconciled. As I minister today and as the word goes forth, I am decreeing a breaking of barriers and obstacles. But what is key for us is to recognize that it's going to take, please get this, action and risk. When we unpack Ruth's story, Naomi's story, we start to see that it's in our actions and risks that we often see God's best work. That's a good word. I'm going to say it one more time. It's in our actions and in our risks that we often see God's best work. God's hand is often in our risks. God often acts in our acts. When you and I begin to look at the passage before us in Ruth chapter 3, 
we start to see one of the most balanced examples of a healthy, biblically appropriate relationship in all of the Bible. We begin looking at the story of Boaz and Ruth. We start to see what health looks like in a relationship. Let me remind you of the story in front of us. Um, The story in front of us starts with a woman from Israel. Her name is Naomi. She's married and she has two sons. While they are living there in Bethlehem, a famine breaks out. Just stay, give me a moment while I bring us up to speed. A famine breaks out. The famine breaks out and she and her husband and their two boys move to a place called Moab. While they are in Moab to survive, the two boys are married. But in the midst of all of that, the husband and both sons die. Now left in the equation in a city of Moab is Naomi and Ruth and Orpah. Ruth and Orpah are the daughter-in-laws of Naomi. Naomi makes up in her mind, I'm going to return to Bethlehem. In her decide to go to return to Bethlehem, Orpah and Ruth initially say, we're going to go with you. Orpah has second thoughts. She returns to Moab, which is a place for her of predictability. It's what she knows. It's the people she's familiar with. But Ruth makes up in her mind that, you know what? I'm going to go wherever you're going. Understand the significance and the dilemma and the desperation of this moment. Because in ancient times, a widow, and now hear this, two widows are returning to Bethlehem. As they return to Bethlehem, understand their situation. In ancient times, a widow's primary source of sustenance was her male relatives. This was a patriarchal society. And as such, a man could always rebound and rebuild his life, even in the midst of tragedy. But women would only secure their significance in society by one of two ways either by marriage or by motherhood. In both situations, Naomi and Ruth possess neither. God has literally allowed them to situate themselves in a worst case scenario. And in this scenario, the only real possibilities they have of being able to survive, being able to function is either slavery, prostitution, or destitution. I want to park here for just a moment and I want to remind somebody that we serve a God that when our back is against the wall and society tries to dictate to us, there is no hope, there is no help, there is no way out, that you and I serve a God that makes a way, I wish I had help, out of no way. Can you reflect back on your life and say there's been moments in my life where I was desperate, where I had no real clue as to how I was going to be all right, but in the midst of all of this, society said I had to sell myself and God said no you don't society said you have to compromise and God said no you don't society said you got to do you got to lie and cheat and God said no you don't and I want to encourage somebody You don't have to sell your soul to the devil in order for God to bless you. You may not know the way. You may not know the how. You may not have the resources. But God is a God that knows how to figure my situation out. They didn't have to resort. They thought they would have to resort to slavery, prostitution, or destitution. And God says, I got another plan. Naomi is so distraught that she sums up her emotion. By saying in chapter one, verse 21, this is her words, not mine. Naomi, how are you feeling in the midst of all of this? You are homeless. You are childless. You are without husband. And your daughter-in-law is in the same situation. Naomi, how are you feeling? Pastor, the Lord has brought me back empty. And I believe as I minister the word today, there are people that are sitting with an emotion and feeling of emptiness. And don't you dare act like you. So let me tell you something. You can be saved 
and love God. You can be successful in life and in marriage and in ministry. You can have money in the bank. You can have good health and you can still wake up in the morning feeling empty. And I wish I had a handful of people that can be honest. I have those moments where I'm feeling sad. I'm feeling bored. I'm feeling lonely. I'm lacking motivation. I'm feeling melancholy. And I'm here to speak to somebody's situation that you might be feeling empty, but God is about to fill you up. You might be feeling empty, but God is about to make a way. You might be feeling empty, but God is about to fix it for you. Put your hands on yourself and say, God is about to fix it for me. And I want to encourage you to have emotion. I want to encourage you to be human. I want to encourage you not to believe the hype of people that would suggest I have to always be smiling and bouncing and everything has to always be perfect and I have to always present my best self. No, no, no. You better start being real with your stuff. I have days when I don't want to do it anymore. I have days when I'm like, God, what are you up to? I've got days where I can't even explain for myself while I'm feeling. Pastor, why? you feeling that way? James, why you feeling that way? I don't even know why. My life is good. My marriage is good. I'm not broke. Ministry is great. But I wake up sometimes feeling empty. And I'm preaching to people today that you're saved, but you're feeling empty. You can sing well, but you're feeling empty. You have a great ministry, but you're feeling empty. You have everything working for you and going for you, and yet you're feeling empty. And even in the worst case circumstance possible, God is saying, I'm going to make sure you live. I'm going to make sure you eat. I'm going to make sure you survive. I'm going to make sure that you can live out your, my perfect purpose in your life. Along the way, Naomi is urging, stay close, I'm going somewhere, urging Ruth, man, leave me. You, I, I don't have anything for you. I, I, I don't have money for you. I don't have children for you. I don't have shelter for you. Girl, 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 I don't even have food for you. All Y'all don't miss what I'm about to say. For women, practically nothing is more important than security. And yet, the one thing Naomi cannot give Ruth is security. And yet, with no security, Ruth still makes up in her mind, I'm going to travel with you. I need to part for a moment and speak this over the life of our congregation. Life is not always about what I can get. Sometimes it's about what I can give. And I think too often times we enter into relationships thinking I'm going to win. I'm going to get something out of this. And as believers, we have to recognize that every circumstance is not for me to get something out. Sometimes God has me here for you. That's a good word for somebody. Sometimes it's not me getting my way. It's about what I need to do for you. If COVID has not taught us anything else, it ought to teach us that I don't always get to follow Jesus on my terms. I don't always get to worship the way I want to. I don't always get to have it my way. It's not always on my terms. Sometimes I've got to take a route that God don't want to take. Sometimes God will put me on a street I don't want to go down because I have to recognize as believers, sometimes it's about what I can give. Not what I can get. So Ruth is stuck with a choice. I'm trying to get to my first point. Hang in there. Ruth is stuck with a choice. She has watched her sister Orpah walk away. She has watched her go back to Moab. Moab for them re represented a place of predictability, a place of possibility, a place of protection. I want to park here for a moment because too often times in life as Christians, God is presenting us a better option. He's presenting us a more God honoring option. But how easily for me to go back and resist the temptation. It is hard to resist the temptation of going back to what I knew. It's hard to go back. It's, it's easy to go back and say, you know what? I don't really know how to I don't really know how to work legitimately, but I know how to go to the pool hall and hustle. I don't really know how to do this other good life, but I do know how to do something back over in Moab. And even as I preach, there are people that are listening to me that don't recognize, resist the temptation 
of going back to what you were. Resist the temptation of doing what is easy. Resist the temptation of doing what you know. Orpah's like, I got to go back. And now I can only imagine as, 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 as Ruth watches her sister walk away in the distance towards Moab. And her and Naomi now are faced with this decision to begin going back to Bethlehem. And she makes a statement in chapter 1, verse 16. She says to her mother-in-law, where you go, I'm going. And where you lodge, I'm going to lodge. And your people shall be my people. And your God will be my God. And where you die, I will die. She was fully aware that she was choosing to uproot her life. I hear the Holy Ghost. She was fully aware that her choice was going to be, I have to live as an outsider. That I'm going to have to endure the disdain as an enemy of Israel. And in the midst of all of that, here come now two widows returning to Bethlehem with the whole community buzzing about them. Oh, wait, weren't y'all the ones? Wait, 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 is that Naomi? You, you, you left with a husband? You left with two boys? Talking about you're going to dodge the bullet. You're going to go to Moab for a little while. Is that, is that Naomi, when I, when I saw you last, you, you had on heels. Now you got on flats. But when, when I saw you last, when I saw you last, you had on makeup. When I saw you last, you had your hair done. But when I saw you last, you had all this stuff going for you. And now when I saw you last, you had your shoulders back and you had your head up and you had your chest out. And now you're humped down and you're looking broken and you're looking beat up. Is this Naomi? And, and, and she says, no, no, no. Don't even call me Naomi. Call me Mara. Because I'm coming back bitter. I'm here speaking to somebody that God is saying it's about time to deal with the bitterness that he's saying it's time enough to make up in your mind. And I want you to understand something. She says I'm bitter. She has her head down. She's all frustrated. She's embarrassed. Watch this. But right next to her was Ruth. I knew y'all would miss it, but I'm gonna help y'all get there. She's bitter by what God has done. And she's so bitter that she's blind that God has sent her somebody to dig her out of what happened in her life. And too many times in our life, we are blinded to Yahweh's presence. We are blinded to God's presence. And we don't recognize that while I'm being bitter about what didn't happen, God has already raised up somebody to raise up my situation. And I'm here to tell somebody, you better open up your eyes. Somebody type in and shout out, open up your eyes. Because your bitterness can mask you of the provision that's right next to you. I just said something. I said your bitterness can mask you of the provision that is right next to you. And while you being mad, the answer is right there with you. While you being jealous, the answer walked home with you. While you being upset with folk, the answer is right there. I'm here to tell somebody, God is working. Somebody shout, God is working. Y'all, we see example upon example that Naomi is now broken by, and, and her brokenness has blinded her to God's care for her. Because the very answer to her dilemma has come back with her. And I don't know who I'm preaching to today, but I'm here to tell you, dry your eyes and hold up your head because the answer is already with you. The answer has already been sent. The help you need has already been provided. You're just so bitter you can't see it. In the midst of this story, in the midst of this context, we learn four things. The first thing that we learn in the midst of this story, in this context, is that number one, now pay attention, the plan, everybody say the plan, the plan and my person must be in agreement. (laughs) 
Uh, see, let me help y'all for a moment. We, we, the plan that Naomi gives Ruth is not one that is real. It's, I would struggle with the plan. Um, you, you want me, oh, 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 oh. You want me to do what? You want me to, in, at nighttime, put on my cloak. That's a word right there. She specifies, get out of your widow stuff. Stop, you start looking like you want what you want to be. That's a whole nother different point to my sermon. I'm going to get there. He says, he says, he says, she says to him, what I want you to do is I want you to go and I want you to go at night and I want you to go to the threshing floor and I want you to uncover his feet and I want you to lay down next to him and then he's going to tell you what to do. Well, what, 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 what he going to tell me? What, what, what he, what, what, what he going to ask for? Uh, this is a good word for somebody, and it can change our lives if we let it. Too often times, God has given us the plan, but my person is not in agreement yet. He's already shown me the way out. And some of us are fighting so hard with the plan, and God is saying, you don't need to like it. You don't need to understand it. You don't even need to approve of it. Just get your person in agreement with the plan. That's what I love about Naomi, what I love about Ruth, because when she gets the plan, this is what she says, Keisha, in verse 5. In verse 5, she says, all that you say, I will do. No debating. I'm talking to somebody. No debating. No pontificating. No asking for further explanation. No, let me, let me, can I ask you a question, God? Uh, no, no, God is saying, no, no, just say, look at me and say, all that I say, I will do. You need to start looking at God and say, all that you say, I will do. That's why some of y'all God stopped talking to. He stopped talking to some of y'all because he knows your person is not in agreement with what he's saying do. Sometimes, I want you to get the value of this and notice what I said in the introduction, that this is about actions and risks, that if we want barriers broken, it is about my actions and my risk. Here is the risk associated with what Ruth does. Sometimes my obedience, Stephanie, can be misinterpreted. This is a risk. This is a risk. If, if, if I do what pastor says, they're going to think I'm not thinking for myself. If, if, if I go ahead and do like pastor has asked, they're they going to think I'm just a flunky. They're they, they, they going to think I don't have my own voice. They're going to think I don't have my own ministry. They're going to think I don't have my own ideas. They're going to think I can't think for myself. Sometimes, this is the risk you take, sometimes your obedience is going to be misinterpreted. This is the risk. He, 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 here's, here's the main point. That, that I think despite the real pain, the potential loss, Ruth chooses to take a risk. You know what a risk is. Kyle, a risk is doing something that's not, the result is not guaranteed. It, it, there, there's no guarantee. Because there's some be some other floor. Can I, can I park here and just minister for a moment? When, you, when we talk about the threshing floor, this is not a private room. This is not some, this is not a motel. And she goes into his motel room. That's not it. Every man who had grain that he had harvested. And everyone, they would lay at the threshing floor once the grain was harvested to protect their grain. So he's not the only man in the room. This is why, this is why Naomi says, see where he lays. Because it's more men laying in there. And I don't want you snuggling up next to the wrong man. That's a good word for somebody. Some of y'all all messed up because you've been snuggling up next to the wrong man. Some of you got your life in a mess because you've been snuggling up next to the wrong man. And can I help you get out of that situation? If you're not saved, you've been snuggling up next to Satan for too long. And I got to make up in my mind, today is the day that I'm going to snuggle up next to Jesus. Today is the day I'm going to be saved. Today is the day where I'm going to hook up with the right man. She says, see where he lays. 
So this is not, I want you to understand something, other people are going to be around watching what she does. And they're going to think, oh, here comes this young Moab girl. She not one of us. I told you them girls back in Moab are loose. I told you those girls back in Moab want to take the shortcut. I told you they, 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 they promiscuous. I told you she's running the risk that my obedience to Naomi is going to be misinterpreted. And I want to I go ahead and, and, and kill this demon. Y'all, y'all, y'all. The main point I want you to see is that in order for God to move, I have to risk obedience. And my person has to be in agreement with the plan. This is a good word for parents. Because this is a problem with our children sometimes. Not every child. But we watch as parents. You can wink at me on the screen if you want to. I, I'll catch it in the spirit. But we as parents watch our children struggle because their person wasn't in agreement with the plan we gave them. This is why people go their own way. And I'm going to let a parent off the hook. Stop walking around feeling like you did a bad job. Stop walking around feeling like you, I'm not a good parent. That he, he's in where she's in or she's in where she's in because I didn't tell him right. No, the first step to God moving is for the person to be in agreement with the plan. And I want to kill the demons of interpretation that have looked at this and have overtly sexually interpreted this situation. Yo, this is not a sexual advance. And I think too often times we overtly sexually interpret situations. I might as well go ahead and just park here for a moment. I mean, we have this tendency when people are different than us, first place our mind want to go is sex. Just because somebody said hello don't mean they want to sleep with you. Just because somebody said you look nice today doesn't mean they want something from you. Just because somebody may have a different sexual orientation than you does not mean they loose and promiscuous. It's amazing to me, and I'm not, here, I'm not here to sensationalize and to put a stamp of approval on homosexuality or people's struggle with their gender, their gender struggles. But I am here to kill a demon, though. It's something, something is wrong that we just automatically assume homosexuals are over-sexualized, more over-sexualized than heterosexuals. Here it is in the text. The assumption is that it's a sexual advance. But when you unpack the Hebrew definitions of the word lie and the word uncover, you will understand that they are not interpreted sexually. What was Ruth risking? She was risking when she uncovers the feet of Boaz. Boaz could have mocked her. He could have been like, oh, you're joking, right? A rich landowner like me? thinks he would want a Moab poor broke girl like you girl please get off this threshing floor she risked that she risked being rejected this was a patriarchal society this was a society that women had no real standing and prominence he could have sexually he could have sexually molested her or raped her and then sent her home he could have humiliated her in front of everybody on the threshing floor. He could have sent her away in the middle of the night. And Ruth knows I'm risking all of this. I want you to understand something. What I want you to see is that there is a connection between our faith in God and our willingness to risk. I, I need to park here because this is life changing. It is for me. You already have. What did Ruth have that she didn't have to be concerned about? Watch this. She had three things. They didn't have food. They didn't have a, a definite place to lay their head. But they did have three things. It's the same three things as a believer you have. She understood no matter what happened, she was already accepted by Naomi. She understood no matter what happens, 
She has security in Naomi from the perspective of Naomi wasn't going to leave her. And she understood that she had unconditional love for Na- from Naomi. Now, this is a mighty good word here. You and I, Eric, always have in Christ acceptance, security, and unconditional love. Which means that security and that acceptance and that unconditional love can't change. Now, watch this. If you're not saved or if you're struggling in your relationship with Christ, even the smallest risk you're not willing to take. You know why? Because you don't want to run the risk of failure. Because you're not confident that if you fail, you're still accepted, you're still secure, and you're still unconditionally loved. For the rest of us who are in our relationship with Christ, when our life is centered upon God, Trishonda, then no risk is too great. (laughs) So I just let y'all in inside my head and heart. Pastor, why in the world would you lead a congregation to the most significant moment in 16 years? Why would you risk 16 years and the most massive capital campaign in the history of the church while people can't even come to the church and while we're in the midst of an international pandemic? I'm so glad you asked. The reason I took the big risk is because my life is centered on God and I know no matter what happens, I'm loved unconditionally, I'm accepted by him, and I'm secure in him. So guess what? No matter what happens, we can't lose. Put your hands on yourself and say, no matter what happens, I can't lose. Tell somebody in your house or in a room you're worshiping in, tell them no matter what happens, you can't lose. If Boaz says, girl, you're crazy, if Boaz molests you, if Boaz doesn't help you, you can still come back home and know you're loved, know you're accepted, and know you're secure. And I'm here to tell somebody, this is why your person has got to hook up with the plan, because no matter what happens, I'm going to be good with God. You know, I I feel like running around this studio in your house right now because I want you to be encouraged. You can't lose the risk you're taking. It's not as big as you think it is. God has got you. At the end of the day, my security is not in being reverend. My security is not in being pastor. My security is not in being James. My security is being saved. It's being with him. It's being, I know he loves me unconditionally. If I fail, he still loves me. If I succeed, he don't love me anymore. No matter what I do, my security is sealed in him. This is why she is able to be obedient to the command and the recommendation of Naomi. Now, understand what happens here, y'all. Understand what happens. What happens in the midst of this is that the blessing is going to happen on the threshing floor. Now, listen to this. The blessing is going to happen on the threshing floor. Now, Pastor, why does this matter? This matters because the whole story begins in the field. Now, this is an important word for somebody. The scene is going to shift and put us to a place where they're no longer in the field. They are on the floor. Now, this is important. The threshing floor is that raised platform. It's usually outside the city, outside the village. It's usually set up on a hill. And this is where they would throw the grain in the air and the breeze would carry away the chaff and the grain would fall on the floor. And while the grain falls on the floor, the men would sleep to protect their harvest. Now, this is important. Uh, Ruth, what you need to get to a better place is not where you've been hanging out. The answer is going to be on the threshing floor. You started in the field. Now, this is a good word for somebody. Too often times, y'all, we stay stuck in the place of origin. Not recognizing that the place of origin may not be the place of development. And so the origin of the blessing is meeting Boaz in the field. Preach Pastor Gail here. But what she needed was not in the field, it was at his feet. 
She needed more than the blessing. She needed the blesser. She needed more than being a worker. She needed to be a wife. And so in the midst of all of this, her environment has got to shift. This is why you've got to be a part of a community. Because the answer to your dilemma is not found with you operating by yourself or, or, or sowing and reaping in an environment where you don't have help and support from other people. It's going to be found in the midst of community, in the midst of a different environment. One of the things that I've struggled with, but I want to release myself and others, is that it is okay that where you started is not going to be where you finish. Some of you can't get past 820 because you have forgotten that the place of origin is not necessarily the place of continual everlasting development. And sometimes God says, I got to shift your environment. I got to put you around a different group of people. Have you ever been hurt? I have by people that have left your life. I've been hurt by people that said, I'll never leave you. You look up, they're gone. I've been hurt by folk that said, I always got you, and they don't. But now I've learned to let those folk off the hook and not lose so much sleep over it because I'm recognizing that sometimes God has to make room. Somebody shout, make room. God has to make room for somebody else to get you across the finish line. And sometimes people are just space holders and other people want to approach you, but they can't because people that don't mean you well won't leave you. They're still always surrounding you. But when folk clear the air and folk get out of the way, then God makes room for some folk that can help you develop in a new place. Oh, preach pastor. So we have to understand y'all. We have to understand that my plan, my person has to be in agreement with the plan. I have so much more to say about that one point. I guess I could have preached my whole sermon at one point. Let me give you the second point. Here's the second point. Everybody say point two. Point one, my person must be in agreement with the plan. Point two, my presentation should prove there has been proper preparation. She says, she says, uh, Naomi says to Ruth, now listen, you just can't show up like you've been in the field. I'm trying to let that sink in for somebody. She's saying, um, when you get there, you need to make sure he's clear. You've prepared for this moment. That, that, that's my struggle with preachers that stand up on Sunday morning talking about the Lord just going to speak to me. I didn't have time to prepare, but the Lord going to speak to me. Y'all can criticize me all you want. I, brought, I usually bring 2,200 words to the pulpit. Today, I brought 3,100 words to the pulpit. And at the end of the day, like what I preach or not, at least let it be said that when I give my presentation, there is proof that there's been proper preparation. And you can say what you want. You don't need to be missing a note on Sunday. We don't need to have a miss on Sunday. The mics don't need to squeal on Sunday. My word needs to be right on Sunday. You don't need to have a stank attitude when you're greeting at the door on Sunday. You don't need to be late on Sunday when you're served. Let your presentation prove there's been preparation. Somebody shout, I prepared for this moment. Some of you want God to bless, but you've not prepared for the moment. You want God to promote you, but you're not prepared for the moment. And if you want God to move in your life, you've got to be prepared when the moment comes. She says, listen, girl, what you're going to do first of all is bathe. When you get there, he don't need to smell the field on you. Come on, here, somebody. Anoint yourself. Put on some perfume. Type in your favorite perfume in your comment line. He, he, he said, adorn yourself. And, and, and put on a cloak. You've been out in these widow clothes too long. I want you, you've been walking around. No, put on wife clothes. And some of us want God to move, but we're not yet ready to clean ourselves up. 
And there has to be a linkage between my approach, my anointing, and my attire. I just said something. There has to be linkage between my approach, my anointing, and my attire. And so Ruth has to first of all get clean. And many times we want to grow in ministry and we want God to open doors, but we don't want to do what 2 Corinthians chapter 7 teaches us. We don't want to cleanse ourselves. Somebody shall cleanse myself. I need to cleanse myself from filthiness of flesh and of spirit and perfecting the holiness in the fear of God. That might mean I need to change my library. I need to get some stuff off my playlist. I need to get some stuff, take some books off, some magazines off my magazine rack. It may mean there's some stuff I can't watch on TV anymore. I've got to make up in my mind that if I'm really wanting God to bless me, I have got to prepare for this moment. You know, in the Old Testament, according to Exodus 30, when a, a priest would come into God's presence defiled, he was in fear of danger of death. God is saying to us, watch this, I want you to get this. Where did Ruth come from? Y'all going like this. I like this if you don't. Where did she come from? She came from the field. The field represented where she came from. It represented her past. Naomi is saying, wash where you've come from off you. (laughs) Too many of us, we come to church, but we've been hurt by other churches. And God is saying, you'll never feel comfortable at word unless you wash your past off of you. Every pastor is not going to steal the money. Every pastor is not going to sleep with your wife. Every pastor is not going to put himself first. Every pa- You got to wash your stuff from your past off you. And I'm here to tell you, I got my own stank. I don't need your stank on me too. Preach Pastor James Gallier. When I interact with you, I don't need your past on me. I got my own past to deal with. I don't need your funk on me and your past on me. I don't need your issue on me. I don't need your bitterness on me. I don't need your resentment on me. Is there anybody listening to me that could be honest? I got my own issues. I got my own struggles. Can you at least wash before you get to me? And some of you all been out of shape with folk, and it has nothing to do with them. It has to do with your past. She says, girl, don't assume every man is going to die on you. Don't assume every man is going to leave you. Don't assume every man is going to be wrong with you. Wash that stuff off you and go uncover his feet and lay down next to him, and let's see what happens. You'd be amazed what might happen if you would get your past off of you and trust what God is doing right now. <sighs> yeah, I'm amazed. She's getting dressed up for something that hasn't happened yet. I, y'all, y'all didn't hear me. <clears throat> She's getting dressed up for something that hasn't happened. Why? I'm glad you asked me. Because God blesses prepared people. Shh. <sighs> See, see, I want you to grab this, y'all. The truth is, when others, y'all, what I'm about to say can change your life. It has changed my life in even preparing this message. If you don't hear anything else in this message, hear this, what I'm about to say to you. When others look at your preparation, they should see your destination. When others look at your preparation, They should see your destination. I'm preparing for where I'm headed. (laughs) I'm preparing for what God is doing. I'm preparing for what's next. There's got to be my person has got to be in agreement with the plan. Number two, my presentation should prove that there has been proper preparation. Here's my third point. My third point, stay close, y'all. I'm almost done. My private desire must intersect with public obedience. My private desire must intersect with public obedience. She desires to be redeemed. She desires for God to use a kinsman redeemer so they can have a future and a hope. 
But too many of us have these private desires that never intersect in a public environment. This is what God is saying to us. You can't just sit at home with your own little desires. You have to get out in the public and make it happen. All y'all that keep singing in the shower, it's time for you to sing on the stage. Come on, all of you that's been praying at home, it's time to start praying at the altar. It's all of you that's talking about how gifted I am and what I want the Lord to do and what I want to see God do in my future. It's time to get on the threshing floor. Can't nobody teach like I can then go teach in Sunday school or church at study. Don't nobody love kids like I can teach any child how to have literacy and read at a proper reading level. Then let's get off of our private environment and let's exhibit public obedience. I, I love my church. Then show up. I love God. Then serve. God is first in my life. Then give. See, too often times, our private desire does not intersect with public obedience. For your glory, I'll do anything. Private desire. Watch this, but you won't get vaccinated. So for his glory, evidently, you won't do anything. So when we sing that song again, don't you say anything. Because we have these private desires, but we don't have an intersection with public obedience. For your glory, I'll do anything except be at rehearsal when it's in, un inconvenient for me. For your glory, I'll do anything except spend an extra hour tutoring kids on a Saturday. For your glory, I'll do anything except going out and feeding homeless folk. For your glory, I'll do anything except doing stuff without being paid. At some point, this private desire has got to intersect with public obedience. I'm almost done. I'm almost done. I'm, I think y'all can't bear much more. So I'm, I'm just, I'm, <laughs> my private, my person and the plan must be in agreement. My presentation should prove that there's been proper preparation. My private desire must intersect with public obedience. And here's the last thing. I need a perspective and process for long-term commitment. Y'all, this is very important. Too often times, God moving in my life is going to be connected to my character. The reason she is able to go lay at the threshing floor, commit herself to Boaz, is because she's already committed herself to Naomi. She already has made up in her mind that I'm going to commit. Everybody say, I'm committed. I want you to understand something. When we're committed, it doesn't leave anything out. See, commitment is not sectionalized it is like well i'm gonna be committed but don't you don't touch this i'm gonna be committed but don't touch that no ruth is committed to a new land she leaves moab and goes to bethlehem remember she wasn't born there she's committed to new leadership she's now willing to follow her mother-in-law who's naomi She's committed to a whole new lifestyle. The lifestyle of those who are Israelites in the land was nothing like the lifestyle of Moab. She was willing to commit to a new Lord. She said to her, your God will be my God. In other words, she, and she says, I'm going to be with you until we die. Which means my commitment does not have limitation to it. And I think too often times we claim commitment, but deep down inside we attach a limitation to it. And God is saying, if I'm going to move in your life in this new space, you've got to make up in your mind, I'm all the way in. Do I have any people that are watching online, that are listening, that can shout out, I'm all the way in? Pastor, I'm all the way in. I know I've got to do some new things. I know I've got to do some new ways. I know I've got to interact with some new people. I know I've got to live in a new place. But I'm here to say, you have to have a long-term commitment. We are 16 years in now. Long-term commitment. 
I made up in my mind, and y'all know my story, and this has happened for other people. I have been offered pastorships around the country of churches much larger and wealthier than Word Tabernacle. But pastorships that, quite frankly, would put me on ease for the rest of my life. But long-term commitment can't be bought. When you're in, you're in. If 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 you're in with your husband, a bigger dollar won't matter. A different complexion won't matter. You're all the way in. And that's what our commitment to the church needs to look like. Sometimes we're going to do some things that people don't like, but I'm all the way in. Sometimes I don't understand every decision, but I'm all the way in. Sometimes it's not the way I want it to be. Sometimes it's not my song or my sermon. But you know what? I have a process and a perspective of long-term commitment. Y'all, I'm done, y'all. Y'all, I, I, I just, can I show you how long-term committed looks like? Let me, let me show it to you. It, it, when you have a moment, you'll, you'll appreciate this. If you don't mind, at your leisure, read Ruth 4. I mean, Ruth, the, Ruth, the four chapters of Ruth. Let me tell you what's going to bless you. You probably have never looked for this before. But as you read the book of Ruth... Start looking at all the different ways Ruth is described. And what you're going to learn is that how she ended up was not how folks saw her in the beginning. But because this was a process, preach Pastor Gale here. Because I had to have a perspective of long-term commitment, I recognize folk won't get it on day one. They won't get it on chapter one. They won't get it. Pastor, help me out. What are you talking about? Well, when we first see her, she is referred to, they don't even call her by name. They say she's a Moabite wife. And then she gets in a family and there's a familial shift. And the familial shift in chapter one and in chapter two, verse 20, and later on in chapter four, she's referred to as daughter-in-law. But then Ruth makes up in her mind that Naomi, rather, starts referring to her not as daughter-in-law, come on, y'all, but as daughter. (laughs) But then the folk won't let her get past her past, and they start referring to her, watch this, as a Moabite woman, because she's not a wife anymore. And then Ruth decides, you know what? I'm sick of y'all naming me. I'm going to start describing myself. She meets Boaz. She says to Boaz, I'm a servant. She comes with humility, the lowest rank of a person. But then when she shows up on the threshing floor, even though it's, it's, it's interpreted servant again at the threshing floor, it's really the Hebrew word for maid servant or handmaiden. So she's now elevating herself. And then the author concludes by naming her the widow of Malon. And then finally, she's referred to as a wife. The story ends with the elders of Bethlehem offering Yahweh's blessings on her life. A woman who was once destitute. She's broken some barriers. A woman who was an outcast, a woman who was not esteemed at all, is now counted amongst the matriarchs of Israel. This is going to make you shout, Steph. It made me shout. A childless, destitute widow, the lowest ranking that a woman could bear. This is where you're going to shout. After 10 years of being married to Malon with no pregnancy, (laughs) the Lord opened up her womb. She and Boaz marry. They marry, and in the midst of being married, they have a son. His name is Obed. We read that the child Obed grows up. He grows up and he becomes a father. He becomes the father of Jesse. And Jesse fathers David. And if you fast forward down 
the ancestry. If you were to plug it in in ancestry.com, what you're going to learn as you start connecting the branches on the family tree is that Ruth becomes seven times. Ruth becomes the great, 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 great grandmother of Jesus. <laughs> I've broken some barriers. Somebody shout, don't sleep on me. I'm breaking barriers. Don't count me out. I'm breaking barriers. Don't say what I can't be. I'm breaking barriers. He who has begun a good work in you is able to complete it and perform it until the coming of Jesus Christ. Eyes have not seen and ears have not heard all that God has planned for you. There's some barriers that are about to come down. I'm done preaching, but if you're listening without a relationship with the Lord Jesus, without a church home where you're growing and serving, I know, I know, I can't believe you really preached an hour. Yes, I did. Because the Lord told me our church had to preach our way out of this. And I'm committed to preaching my way out of this. And I'm here to tell you, if you're here without a relationship with the Lord, without a church home where you're growing and where you're serving, I want you to connect the link. I want you to say, this is the moment I'm going to be part of a community. You're starting off in the field, and now God is trying to take you to the fresh threshing floor. You started off at, uh, in the field, but the blessing is at the feet of Boaz. It's at the feet of Jesus. And so come on, while we just lift up a song, and as we worship together as a church family, I want to give you time to come to the altar, the altar of your living room, the altar of your home. Pull over in your car. Put your hands on your steering wheel. Let your front seat be your altar. Come on, let your living room be your altar. Let your dining room table be your altar. Come on, lay yourself at the altar. This is the moment where it's time to get in God's agreement with the plan. And so come on, let's lift this up together, y'all. Let's lift it up together. And then we're going to pray. Oh, God. Are you hearing that? This is the change that's about to come. You have to believe it. You have to receive it. Come on, sing it. Lift it up. Come on, we're singing to you. This is where the word needs to be made real. Come on, type in, I want to be saved. Type in, I want to join the church. I need to be a part of a community that's going to take me farther. I start at one place, but it's going to develop in a different place. I believe God is saying this is the place he wants you to develop in. So if you don't have a church home where you're growing in, this is the moment. If you're somewhere else in the country, you're active in a church, but you want to partner with us, would you log in and say, man, I want to partner with the Word Tabernacle. Thank you, God. Everything, 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 it's, it's all in commitment. Thank you, God. Come on, type in, I want to be saved. Type in, I'm joining the church. Click the button, the, the radio button. Put in your name, email address. If you have a prayer request, would you give us that right now? We want to pray starting today for you. Our ministers are going to reach out to you. Oh, God. Oh, God, do you receive that? Everything is changing. Come on, even as we're about to pray, everything is changing. Oh, God. Yes, God. Thank you, God. Receive it, receive it. I'm about to pray. Come on, while we're singing, before we, fit, before we end with prayer, if you've made your decisions now, would you go ahead and give your offering? Go ahead and give your offering. Prepare to drive by the church. Drop it off. Mail it. Every member growing. Every member serving. Every member giving. Somebody type that in. Every member growing. Every member serving. Every member giving. That's who we are as Wordites. That's who we're going to be. That's what God is going to do in this season. Every member growing. Every member giving. Every member serving. Thank you, God. Oh, God, we love you, Lord. Yes. Come on, y'all. One more time. Lift that up. God. No lack. Full healing. Everything is changing. Come on, y'all. Sing that real soft for me so we can pray together. Sing that real soft for me. Come on, you're at the altar with me. 
Real soft, real soft. Lord, we thank you for this day of worship. We thank you for this opportunity to grow together. And God, what I am speaking over our congregation in this closing prayer is that barriers are breaking. Obstacles are being removed. That you're doing something great in my life. Lord, forgive me when you have given me the plan and I didn't like it. And my person was not in agreement. Today, as we lay at our own altars in our various places, we say to you, God, as Ruth said to Naomi, all that you say, I will do. All that you say, I will do. Lord, I may not understand it, but I'll do it. I may not like it, but I will do it. It may not agree with my own perspective, but I'll do it. So today, God, we lay ourselves at the altar and we say to you, God, my person will be in agreement with your plan. Lord, forgive me when I've tried to preach, teach, sing, play without proper preparation. Forgive me, God, when I've tried to get on to a men's round table, women's round table, not been properly prepared. Forgive me, God, when I've stood at the door greeting God with alcohol on my breath. Forgive me, God, when I've tried to do ministry, but there's not been preparation. I've not been willing to clean myself. There's not been linkage between my approach, my attire, and my anointing. Today, God, we ask that you would forgive us, and today, God, we freshly commit ourselves to you. And we say, God, we are fully in for preparation. And so, God, as I stand and preach to your people every Sunday, let them be said. Even if they don't like the sermon, God, even if they don't agree with everything I've said, let it be said, our pastor prepares. As Bible study is being taught, let it be said, we prepare. As we lead in our women's groups and our men's groups, our, our church at study groups, our, our thrive groups, let it be said, we are prepared. God, everything that we do in every moment of this ministry, let it be said, we are prepared. God, as our stronghold keepers and security and pastoral support come back to campus, as every ministry begins to come back to campus, let it be said we are prepared. As we start to invite young people into Impact, Impact Academy, let those young people know our, my teachers are prepared, our staff is prepared. Let us not be taken off guard or by surprise in anything that you're doing, God, because we understand that you will bless and open doors for people that are prepared. Lord, forgive me when I've been claiming private stuff, but there's not been an intersection with a public obedience. God, for that person that's been singing at home, it's time to publicly obey and sing in public. For that person that's been praying in private, it's time to let it happen in public. For those persons that, that say, God, they love children, it's time for that to intersect with their public obedience. And so, God... God, drive us to a place of service. Let it be said of Word Ice that every member of our church is serving. Let it be said that every member is growing. Let it be said every member is giving. And then, God, I pray for a long-term commitment. Help me to be able to say, like Ruth, this thing is going to end with death. Wherever you die is where I'm dying. You don't have to worry about me leaving you. You don't have to worry about me being offended and going somewhere else. You don't have to worry about me running back to Moab. I'm in. Let it be said of us as a church community, we are in. Whether we worship at 820 in a high school gym, a temporary sanctuary, or a final sanctuary, let it be said, I'm in. Whether we come back to in-person worship in a month, whether we come back in four months, let it be said, I'm in. God, God, if I have to keep doing Zoom meetings for a little while longer, I'm in. God, if we have to keep physically distancing, we're in. God, whatever it needs to look like, God, we're committed. God, we are here. It was said earlier, God, we are here so that you might be made famous. We want you famous, God. And I need to be in to do that. And then I pray, God, that your choice and assorted blessings would rest upon your people. Thank you for the offering. Thank you for the growing of your kingdom, the building of your kingdom, the spread of your word. Thank you for the decisions and thank you for the sharing of this message. 
And for all that you're doing and for who you are, we give you praise. Now, God, bless your people. Let your face smile upon them. Let your countenance shine upon them. Show forth your mercy and grace. And let us be able to say of our lives, we are blessed. Thank you for every broken barrier. And for all that you're doing and for who you are, we give you praise in Jesus' name. I love y'all. God bless you. Amen. Have an awesome day.